So far, only one person has experienced the full, absolutely complete transforming power of Christ's resurrection, his mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary. When her earthly mission was complete, she was assumed body and soul into heaven. The rest of Christ's followers have to wait until he comes again before we can enter body and soul into God's glory. But that doesn't mean that we can't yet experience at all the transforming power of Christ's resurrection. We can. And one of the ways we can is simply by contemplating the eternal truths, among which are the four last things. In his preaching, Jesus gave true answers to mankind's most burning questions about life and death and life after death. And by rising from the dead, he backed up those answers with an unprecedented proof of his credibility. In a sense, he showed us visibly and tangibly those answers. In the past, popular culture accepted and reiterated what Jesus taught us about life and death, but not anymore. Now our post-Christian culture tirelessly portrays images and stories that may seem innocent enough on the surface, they are just fiction after all, but that subtly bombard us with a distinctly non-Christian point of view regarding the eternal truths. And those false ideas because they are repeated so frequently and wrapped up in such entertaining packages, can easily seep into our consciousness, inadvertently weakening or even undermining our Christian convictions. And that's why it's a good idea every once in a while to polish up our knowledge, our understanding of what Jesus has revealed to us about death, judgment, heaven, and hell. And that's what we will do in this conference. The first of the four last things is death. The Bible teaches us that death comes for everyone, and it comes only once. This directly contradicts two ideas circulating through postmodern culture, ideas that are not, by the way, new in the history of humanity. The first is the concept of reincarnation, that instead of dying once, each human soul is somehow recycled and after dying, it enters back into the world wrapped up in a new body. Reincarnation appears on the surface to be a comforting doctrine. It seems to give people a second chance. If they had everything against them in their previous life and simply couldn't climb out of moral misery, they will be given another shot at living a worthwhile life. But that's a superficial interpretation of this pagan and philosophically untenable position. If reincarnation were true, then human freedom would be false. Instead of truly being responsible for our own actions, reactions, and decisions, as Jesus teaches that we are, we would just be raw material for some kind of universal force, a, fo a force that recycles us however many times is necessary to reabsorb us into the impersonal ground of being. The idea of reincarnation contradicts human dignity. Besides being untrue, it also degrades our vision of the human person. But there's another false idea out there as well. This is the idea that continued technical progress would eventually enable us to overcome death and live forever. Whether through quantum physics or genetic engineering or nanochemical medical practices, outlying prophets of humanity's self-idolization hold up this seductive promise of earthly life without limits. It's a new expression of the most ancient temptation. When the serpent in the Garden of Eden promised Adam and Eve that by eating the forbidden fruit, they would certainly not die and would be like gods. But such is not the case. In the fallen world, death comes for everyone sooner or later, and it only comes once. As the letter to the Hebrews puts it, just as it is appointed that human beings die once, and after this the judgment, so also Christ, offered once to take away the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to take away sin, but to bring salvation to those who eagerly await him. Instead of resisting what God has revealed to us about death, we simply need to accept it and allow it to shape our lives. 
Death is one of the few things we can count on in life. Death is the definitive end of our earthly journey, the completion of our life mission, the beginning of eternity. It's the last word of the introduction and the first word of chapter one. Knowing that each one of us is going to die gives weight to how we live, especially because we don't know when we will die. And so every moment of our lives becomes a chance, an opportunity to fulfill or not to fulfill the great commandments of loving God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Death is the period at the end of the sentence we've been writing our whole life long. It's the finish line for the race of life, the completion, the fulfillment, the finale. The postmodern tendency to avoid thinking about death is unchristian. The church purposely keeps the crucifix ever before our eyes. One of the most common Catholic prayers, the Hail Mary, reminds us of death every time we pray it. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Although death entered the world because of sin, Christ has redeemed it, bathing it in his grace. The surest way to die well is to live well, and one sure way to live well is to keep in mind that we will die. This doesn't need to be morbid. Rather, to ignore death would be morbid. It would be tragic. To keep death in mind in a healthy way, it is enough to visit the cemetery and lay some flowers on the graves of our loved ones, to pray for them. It is enough to live closely the rhythm of the church's liturgy, which reminds us, gently but firmly, that this brief life here on earth is not all there is. It is enough to minister to the sick, to pay attention to the needs and the wisdom of our older family members. Then this fundamental reality will duly season our attitudes, our relationships, and our personal decisions with compassion and with truth. And then, when death comes knocking at our door, we'll have no regrets, but only smiles, both for the beauty that we left behind and for the beauty still in store. The remaining three last things all have to do with what happens after death. This too has been revealed by God. He wants us to know. After death comes judgment. Judgment is simply the moment when we appear face to face before God and he tells us the whole truth about how we've chosen to live our lives, and as a result, the kind of person we've become. Nothing is left out of God's judgment because he is perfectly fair and perfectly loving. He will take into account every factor that has influenced how we've lived. And yet, because he's given us the gift of freedom, of responsibility, there will be consequences for the decisions we've made. We face God for individual judgment when we die, and then, at the end of history, the last judgment will take place, when the whole human story will be revealed and all evil will be repaired. Here's how the Bible explains it. I saw the dead, the great and the lowly, standing before the throne, and scrolls were opened. Then another scroll was opened, the Book of Life. The dead were judged according to their deeds by what was written in the scrolls. And here's how the Catechism explains it. Each man receives his eternal retribution in his immortal soul at the very moment of his death in a particular judgment that refers his life to Christ, either entrance into the blessedness of heaven through a purification or immediately, or immediate and everlasting damnation. And that brings us to the last of the four last things, heaven and hell. These are perhaps the most misunderstood of all in our secularized culture. Often their existence is simply denied. Sometimes heaven is presented as boring and lackluster. No one would ever really want to go to the heaven depicted by Hollywood. Sometimes hell is presented as the harsh and unfair revenge of a vindictive God Proof that Christianity simply can't be true, because how could a loving God send people into everlasting torment? 
These and other distortions of the truths that God has revealed to us come from projecting our own limitations onto God. Just because our imaginations are too paltry to imagine how the absolute happiness of heaven could be completely satisfying if it didn't look a lot like our best days here on earth, doesn't mean that God's imagination is that paltry. And just because it's hard for us to imagine how some people would freely, repeatedly, and definitively choose to adore themselves instead of entering into a loving relationship with God, in spite of God's abundant efforts to convince them otherwise, doesn't mean that God is going to overrule their freedom and force them into heaven. Here's how the Catechism explains it. God predestines no one to go to hell. For this, a willful turning away from God, a mortal sin, is necessary, and persistence in it until the end. People who die in friendship with God, but still have habits of selfishness and sin, need to be purified of them before they can enjoy the fullness of heavenly glory. This is the origin of the doctrine of purgatory. How that purification takes place is still a topic of debate among theologians, but the fact that it does take place is not only logical, but also a revealed truth of our faith. The more we learn about the four last things, and there's a lot to learn, 2,000 years worth of theological reflection and spiritual experience, the more our understanding of life and death and life after death will be in harmony with the way things really are. And the more our minds are in sync with the truth, the easier it will be for us to live our lives as God intends them to be lived. And this is the sure path to experiencing not only the hope-filled joy of Christmas, but the powerfully transformative joy of Easter. Take some time now to reflect prayerfully on the 10 questions in the personal questionnaire. They're designed to help you apply these eternal truths to your daily life.